The Jedi Council orders Obi-Wan to investigate who the bounty hunter was while Anakin is told to take Padme back to Naboo, where she'll be safer on her home turf. Some more scenes are cut from the comic, and these ones are definitely a mistake. Palpatine meeting with Anakin, which establishes that he's been acting as something of a mentor and father figure for him. Considering the next scene in the comic features Anakin complaining about Obi-Wan's teachings, it's a nice bit of manipulation. We've seen Anakin's growing frustration with Obi-Wan, who keeps being short with him and telling him to obey his orders while never giving him any credit. Palpatine, by contrast, boosts him up, tells him about how great and powerful he is, and that someday he'll be the best Jedi. Of course he's leaning towards the guy who actually gives him positive feedback. It's a good scene, except for the crappy CGI surroundings anyway. Yeah, people pointed out that a lot of the Phantom Menace was actually practical effects, Though I am dubious of the more practical effects in that movie than in all of the original trilogy combined claims. Because, come on. But it's in Attack of the Clones where the CGI overuse really becomes an issue. But yeah, Palpatine's manipulations here are an important step. Cutting it was a mistake. The next scene that's cut has the same CGI surroundings issue, plus the CGI Yoda that I hate. But in this case, it's about Obi-Wan talking with Yoda and Mace Windu about Anakin and his concerns about his arrogance. Yoda says it's a trait that's becoming all too common among Jedi. Which, if it is, it's very subtle. And Mace Windu reminds him that if the prophecy is true, then Anakin will be the one to bring balance to the Force. Okay, I mentioned last time that the prophecy could have been useful for turning Anakin. We keep being told that Anakin has these super special awesome superior Jedi skills, but never really see that. Like, the closest we get is him jumping out of the car and landing on Zams, having sensed where she'd be. Impressive, but we see ridiculous stuff like that from Jedi all the time. It's just a big problem of show-don't-tell with the movie. But yeah, the prophecy. We're never really shown if Anakin is aware of it. If he is, he never mentions it. He was in the room as a little kid when it was mentioned, but there's no guarantee he actually picked up on it. But let's say he is made aware of it. If his supposed exceptional power makes him arrogant, what's it gonna do if he's told he's special? He's the chosen one. That's the kind of thing that can go to someone's head. Suddenly, he assumes he can do no wrong. Who are you to question him? He's the one who will bring balance to the Force, after all. His actions must always be right. And if those actions lead to him imposing his will on others, choking them when they don't agree with him, well, what does it matter? He's the chosen one, after all. I'm just saying, if you're not gonna bother telling us what's in the prophecy, at least make good use of it. Anyway, we start on our advancement of the romance subplot as Padme packs her things to leave. The dialogue is expanded from what it was in the original, but it mostly keeps the same beats, with the exception of adding in that he asks her not to call him Annie anymore, since he doesn't want to be thought of as a little boy like the nickname implies. This scene is one of the ones that really shows the romance is on the wrong track. Anakin complains about Obi-Wan in a very whiny, childish way, and when Padme tries to reassure him and be nice, he starts flirting with her and she tells him to stop because it makes her uncomfortable. At least in the comic, he looks genuinely sorry about it, but in the movie, he half-heartedly apologizes and smiles like a creepy doofus who's all, Yeah, she's totally into me. Ugh. Later, the two are leaving on a crappy public transport so as not to attract attention, with Padme talking to her head of security and her new decoy, both of whom will be staying to hopefully not let it slip that she's left. Be safe, milady. Thank you, Captain. Take good care of Dorme. The threat's on you two now. Thank you, Senator. I know I could never be as good a friend and decoy as Corday was, but damn it, I'm gonna try to live up to her grand example! Obi-Wan begins his investigation in a cutscene that was best left on the chopping room floor. Robots examine the dart and say it doesn't conform with anything known in their database, so it's likely a custom thing. This is what leads him to the next scene, with Dexter Jetster and his 50s diner. In space. The comic underplays the 50s diner aspect considerably. I don't know how to feel about it myself. I mean, say what you will about Amidala's dresses last time being inspired by various ones from other cultures, and while I appreciate the hard work and creative inspiration that went into the design and creation of those outfits, I'm sorry, they still look stupid and goofy to me. Remember, you're free to disagree on anything in these videos, just as I can disagree right back. Those things were inspired by them, not just trying to copy them wholesale. This is just... A 50s American diner, but with robots. 
It's just a weird... I don't know if anachronism is the right word for it, but it feels out of place with Star Wars. Anyway, Dexter tells Obi-Wan that the dart comes from the planet Kamino, a place beyond the Outer Rim that he should be able to locate in the Jedi Archive. They specialize in cloning, especially if you have enough money to afford them. Or at least if you can mind trick them into believing credits will do fine. Back on the transport, Anakin and Padme talk about Naboo. I look forward to seeing Naboo again. I've thought about it every day since I left. You thought of her every day, you thought of Naboo every day. You don't really get a lot done as a Jedi, do you? The conversation steers towards the Jedi life. Padme comments that it must be hard to be sworn to the duties of it, not being able to visit the places you like, do the things you want to do, or be with the people I love. Are you allowed to love? I thought it was forbidden for a Jedi. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. So you might say, we're encouraged to love. This is the closest we get to an explanation about the Jedi view on relationships, and it's still annoyingly vague. We'll get into it more later. You have changed so much. You haven't changed a bit. You're exactly the way I remember you in my dreams. And the comic leaves out her reaction to that, which is an uncomfortable stare and him recognizing, yet again, swing and a miss. This is really the big problem with this movie. Most of their scenes together can be described as Padme tries to be accommodating and nice, Anakin makes it creepy and wince-inducing. Next up is a scene that was cut down a bit in the movie. Obi-Wan is in the Jedi archives and talks to a librarian there who... Yeesh, the comic does not do her justice. Her upper lip has a shadow on it and is severely wrinkled, so it makes it look like she's got the same kind of mustache as Dexter Jetster. Anyway, there's a bust of Count Dooku in the archive, the librarian saying that he was a brilliant Jedi who left because he lost faith in the Republic and was often out of step with the Council, much like Qui-Gon. I really do wish they had left this in. They seem to be trying to make us unsure if he was actually a bad guy, especially given later dialogue, he says. Otherwise, Obi-Wan's having trouble locating Kamino in the Archive. The Librarian says that it doesn't seem to exist. Impossible. Perhaps the Archives are incomplete. If an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist. There's nothing in here on the history of chair design and construction. Chairs don't exist. I am literally sitting in one right now. Figment of your imagination, you're actually squatting. There's nothing in here about forks, either. The hell are forks? We only have spoons and sporks. Okay, why do you have information on sporks, but not forks? Stop making up fairy tale utensils, Kenobi! He goes to see Yoda, who's teaching a class of little kids in lightsaber blocking using that trick first seen in A New Hope with the blast shield down. This is part of that whole, this weapon is your life thing that I hate, and it ties back to Yoda. More later. Anyway, Obi-Wan decided to interrupt class to look for help in finding Kamino. Yoda decides to use this for his class, and in theory, this would actually be kind of cool. Using the power of the Force to detect something that was hidden, but no, they just look at a star chart, which shows a big noticeable gap where Kamino should be, and some kid who looks absolutely doofy in the comic suggests that the information was deleted from the archive. Truly wonderful the mind of a child is. Yeah, only a child could think of. Maybe someone deleted it. This feels like one of those old jokes about kids acting as tech support for their out-of-touch parents. Anyway, Obi-Wan is sent off to the spot where Kamino should be while we cut over to Anakin and Padme. There's an extended version of this scene that was deleted, it's not in the comic version sadly, that included some more dialogue between the two, which mentions Padme's family, who would turn up in another deleted scene, as well as some more fleshing out of Padme's backstory. Some of it might come across as asinine and boring, but at least during that I have an easier time buying a relationship between the two, since Anakin isn't embarrassing himself during it. Mind you, the artwork does not help. What with this sleepy-eyed Anakin with an expression that says, I want to stare at you while you bathe. I wasn't the youngest queen ever elected, but now that I think back on it, I'm not sure I was old enough. I was way too over-emotional back then. I could just fly off the handle if my makeup wasn't applied symmetrically. So at least that answers that. Not all the queens are teenagers, though it still seems bizarre that it happens at all. Who the hell wanted a more boring Star Wars version of Prez? 
There's a meeting with the current queen to brief her about the situation with the Separatists. The queen's outfit now is less over the top than it was in the last movie, though apparently she decided today to dress like a black daisy for the elementary school play. We also learn that the Viceroy, who is actually named Newt Gunray, I don't think they ever actually named him in the comic adaptation last time, is still in charge of the Trade Federation. After another bit of Anakin being petulant for no good reason, we cut over to another deleted scene that was wisely cut. Mace saying, his farewell to Obi-Wan. It just repeats information we were already given earlier. And then back over to Anakin and Padme, who are now staying in the countryside for the time being to help protect her. They're nearby the ocean, and... Well, it's time. The line, the legend. See that island? We used to swim there every day. I love the water. We used to lie on the sand and let the sun dry us. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. So we're probably not inviting it to board game night. It's hard to pin down exactly what it is that's so laughable about it. It might just be Hayden's delivery, because on its own, if you just read it, it doesn't seem so bad. And yet it's something we've latched onto. Darth Vader's intense hatred of sand. I mean, you notice he went down to Hoth personally, was willing to walk around on Endor, but when they were searching for the Death Star plans, he never set one foot on Tatooine again. Frankly, it's a wonder he didn't turn the entire Star Destroyer's weapon systems down onto the planet and literally turn it to glass while they were there. Maybe the problem is more the clunky and creepy transition Anakin uses then. Not like here. Here, everything's soft and smooth and deeply inappropriate. Padme talks about some old guy she used to know who'd make glass objects out of the beach sand. They were magical. Everything here is magical. And yeah, that's the look of a woman who's done with this guy's bullcrap. But no, she kisses him and then withdraws, saying she shouldn't have done that. Credit where it's due, the flowers surrounding the frame in the comic are a nice touch for romance. It's a pity that this makes no sense, considering she has shown clear disdain and discomfort over his romantic advances. And that's the thing, the script wants it to be, oh, she's into him too, but is worried about social implications. But the actual performance is, oh god, I'm trapped alone with a creepy guy who won't stop hitting on me and who can choke me with his mind! While romance stories where two characters just interact with each other over the course of the story can and do happen, simply put, most of this is bad. It's boring and dull and keeps throwing up warning signs why these two should not be together. And even if the performances were better and matched the mood they wanted, it's still just kind of boring. In my opinion, the way to do it, especially in Star Wars where you want to keep up the momentum, you get the two going off on an adventure together. Sure, they do eventually head off Naboo to go do stuff for characterization, but for the first part of that, Padme is just along for the ride. Force them into a situation where they have to spend all their time together, exchanging witty banter while dealing with life and death struggles that bring them closer emotionally to each other, investigating the assassination attempt from a different angle that reveals the other half of the puzzle from what Obi-Wan is looking into. Because yeah, Obi-Wan's plot despite some hiccups, is a far more interesting one. It's a mystery hitting some detective story tropes, like the old informant who has unique insight for him, or how each new revelation adds a new layer to the mystery that keeps you wanting to find out the next piece of the puzzle. Whereas with Anakin, it's... I don't like sand. This could also build on the Anakin is reckless and disobedient thing by having him defy the orders of the Jedi Council and Obi-Wan repeatedly while letting us really start sympathizing with him despite his darker side. We can also see how a fascistic mindset can really build up as he's constantly ordered by the Jedi to, say, not help people, not oppose injustices, making him think he knows better than them, when in reality there are good reasons for why they tell him not to do something, because his way is more expedient, but could also do more long-term harm. Anyway, over to Obi-Wan's part as he arrives on Kamino. And I love Kamino. Admittedly, this all-white design aesthetic has kind of become very popular in the last decade for depicting a high-tech environment, because even Star Wars has Apple stores. 
But this was made before all that, and it's a very different sort of place to anything we've seen in the movies before this. A huge ocean world, constantly raining place, but this very cool, very alien looking and advanced area. And the calm, pleasant demeanor of the Kaminoans themselves is very refreshing and kind of unique for these movies. Still don't understand how Obi-Wan knew to come to this city and land on the exact place where he could meet their leadership and thus get some of the answers, but yeah. He's warmly greeted by the Kaminoans and their prime minister, who say that he's expected. Not him in particular, but a Jedi, to check on their progress after this current project they're working on was commissioned. Obi-Wan plays along and learns that they're creating a clone army for the Republic, commissioned by a Jedi named sifo -Dyas. Now, you may be wondering who sifo -Dyas is. I have no idea. They just mention he died ten years ago and then never bring him up again. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's explained in some book, but whatever, let's keep moving. The clones have been genetically manipulated to make them less independent than the person they were cloned from, Jango Fett, whose only request, aside from his considerable pay, was to have an unaltered clone for himself. Yep, having one unaltered clone of yourself to raise as your son, this is the way. The clones also have growth accelerants so that they'll actually, you know be adults in any combat they'd be engaged in, as opposed to having an army of child slave soldiers. And seeing the fully equipped clones, we of course can tell that they're proto-stormtroopers. Back over to Padme and Anakin, they're enjoying hanging out in a field and doing a lot better being endearing as a romantic couple, though it's awkward for the audience because Anakin casually drops how he thinks a dictatorship is a perfectly good idea because politicians are dickholes who don't tend to care about people. Admittedly, for Padme, she thinks he's just joking, hence why she's not worried about it. Over to Obi-Wan, he's brought to Jango Fett and his young clone, the future Boba Fett. The dialogue isn't really that important for this. It's pretty clear that both know why the other is here. That being said, when Obi-Wan asks about sifo -Dyas, Jango doesn't know who he's talking about saying he was hired by a man named Tyrannus. Lord Tyrannus is Count Dooku's Sith name, which just makes me wonder, why didn't they just have Lord Tyrannus be the one who commissioned the clone army instead of Sir not appearing in this or any film? I mean, it's never a name that's said to any of our heroes, so it's not like they'd be able to connect the dots back to the Sith with it. Back over to Naboo, time for star-crossed lover stuff that's never really explained properly. Padme pretty much confirms that she's into him too, but they can't be together. What hurts the scene is the delivery. The lines themselves, where Anakin talks about how much it pains him to not be with her, aren't too bad, but the way they're delivered feels forced and phonetic, as if he's trying to make sure he gets out each syllable exactly as written and at the same pace and tone for each sentence. It feels staged and unnatural, which is why him saying stuff like, I'm haunted by the kiss you should never have given me. Sounds more like a poor recitation of Shakespeare than him actually pouring his heart out. In addition, Lucas apparently felt like he needed to use as few contractions as possible. So again, these lines end up sounding robotic. And of course, there's always this gem. I wish that I could just wish away my feelings. I really want to know if Lucas thought that was clever wordplay or just didn't even notice. The dialogue in the comic is pretty much the same as the movie, except for one line missing. Padme's explanation from her side why they can't be together? I'm a senator. And that is incredibly stupid. Instead, without that line, it feels like it's more about jeopardizing Anakin's place in the Jedi. Because after all, Jedi are not allowed to fall in love because one time, twin brothers loved the same woman and their battle ended up blowing up a planet. Totally happened. Check out Comic Book Quickies number one. So, yeah, let's quickly talk about the Jedi and love thing because it leads into a point about these movies that's so frustrating. As many fans will be keen to point out, it's not that Jedi are not allowed to love, it's that strong attachments have the capacity to split a Jedi's dedication. Devoting yourself to one person can interfere with the greater goal of protecting the innocent and keeping the peace, to the point where you're so worried about the other person that it corrupts your love into obsession or some other negative emotion. One cannot serve two masters and all that. It's a philosophical point that has some grounding, and indeed, Jedi can 
can fall in love, get married, have children, yada yada yada. The problem is, I only know all that because of supplementary material and expanded universe stuff. It's not in the movie! The Jedi philosophy is painfully absent in the prequels, where as far as we know, what's standing in the way of this relationship is just, Jedi are not allowed to fall in love, and I'm a senator. I shouldn't have to read a book or play a video game or whatever in order to know this stuff. If that's really how it works, then the movie should say it! But the movie doesn't say anything! I mean, I suppose it tells us we should avoid falling into a nest of gundarks, but that just seems like good advice in general. It's why I'm not even bothering to try to look up EU explanations for stuff like Amidala's ridiculous outfits in The Phantom Menace. It's not in the movie, so what does it even matter? The EU seems to exist purely to explain away problems with the films, but in turn, the expanded universe has its own collection of people who have their own ideas for how Star Wars should be. And it's a big problem because they sometimes end up directly contradicting what the films say. If they say say anything at all! This is why when I'm reviewing these movies, I'm going 99% by only what's in the movie! Because that's what I'm reviewing! Telling me that some discrepancy or goof is explained away in a comic or a book or a video game or something doesn't help! Because how the hell am I supposed to know that?! It's not in the movie! It's not in the movie! I'm willing to try to rationalize stuff like the assassination method or Palpatine's plans, but the movie has to meet me halfway here! Whatever. The two say they can't be together in secret because they don't want to live a lie. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan contacts the Jedi Council to inform them of his findings. R4, relay this. Scramble code 5 to Coruscant. Care of the old folks' home. That's right. I did the Iggy. He informs them of the clone army, but admits it's weird that there doesn't seem to be a connection between the cloners and the assassination because there's no motive. Although, yes there is. If the Republic votes to not make an army, there's no need for the clone troopers, and the Jedi have no record of making this order, so the Kaminoans can't necessarily prove that the order was made, so trying to kill someone who's trying to block the army's authorization is indeed a motive. He's ordered to apprehend Django. Back on Naboo, Anakin awakes from a nightmare about his mother, which he's apparently been having quite a few of lately, admitting to Padme that he can sense she's suffering and in pain. He decides he has to go investigate this despite his mandate to protect Padme, but she's all on board with going with him to try to help. Much like The Last Jedi, there does seem to be a bit of a timeline wonkiness with the two plots. Padme and Anakin are on Naboo for what seems to be several days, Yet all Obi-Wan has done is gone to Kamino. Feels like no longer than a day has passed. Admittedly, Kamino is supposed to be past the Outer Rim, so maybe Obi-Wan was sitting in his fighter for several days on the trip, catching up on reading a book. Finding self-affirmation through your midichlorians. Obi-Wan goes to try to apprehend Jango, and a good fight ensues, but ultimately he gets away. Fortunately, Obi-Wan was able to put a tracking device on his ship so he can pursue. Anakin and Padme arrive on Tatooine and find Watto, who explains that he sold Shmi to a guy named Lars, who freed her and married her. Okay, a thing I like about the movie right here. Anakin's cold demeanor to Watto is a good bit of character writing, especially since they don't call attention to it. Watto's all excited to see him again, but of course Anakin's not going to be happy. He was a slave to him. This is not a happy reunion. Watto should feel lucky Anakin's not actually in the dark side yet, or he would have used the Force to rip his wings off. Anyway, he points the two in the direction of Lars's moisture farm. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan tracks Jango to the planet Geonosis, but Jango discovers the tracker and we get a little chase. It's admittedly a good spectacle in the movie. It's not as good in the comic, though a bit unnecessary since they just had a fight scene. Yeah, yeah, space battle versus melee combat, but still. Anyway, Obi-Wan manages to elude them and make them think he's done for. Back on Tatooine, the two arrive and encounter 3PO. So some people were apparently confused by my remarks last time about why George Lucas would have Anakin be the builder of C-3PO, explaining that Anakin built him to help his mother. That's not what I was asking. Yeah, in story, that's why he built him. I realize this might be a generational issue, because of course anyone who started with the prequels won't see anything weird about it. But for those of us who started with the original trilogy, this connection is bizarre and unnecessary. 
It'd be like revealing that Lando Calrissian built R2-D2. Sure, there's no in-story reason why it couldn't happen, but two characters who otherwise had nothing at all to do with each other suddenly have a connection like that. It's such a weird, retconned coincidence. He built him to help his mother was also used to explain why Anakin didn't take 3PO with him. Except 3PO wasn't done yet. That was the whole point. He was building 3PO to help Shmi, but he's no good to her in the state he left him in. We're never given any indication Shmi knows anything about building robots, so 3PO is just taking up space in her house. But I guess she must have some knowledge since he's now completed. Not painted gold yet, but yeah. He brings the two inside to meet Klieg Lars, his son Owen, and Owen's girlfriend Baru. I'm a bit iffy about the revelation that Luke isn't actually a blood relative of Uncle Owen and Aunt Baru. Not because adoption isn't still family, of course not. It's just frustrating because it feels like this is only a thing to reinforce the divine right of kings crap. They don't have that mighty Skywalker blood and all that. And hey, Anakin has a stepbrother and stepfather now, but he doesn't give a crap. I know, he's here for his mother, but it just seems like he should have some sort of emotional reaction to all this news. And it also makes me wonder, did Shmi ever try to contact Anakin to let him know all this? God, I hope so. That's something else I forgot to bring up last time. How friggin' cavalier she was to just let her nine-year-old son go with some stranger she knew nothing about with no guarantee they'd ever see each other again. Yeah, she probably wouldn't have been able to get through to him, but I'd like to think she at least tried, especially after she was freed. Anyway, Klieg explains that Tusken Raiders kidnapped her a month ago. They tried sending out a search party of 30 men, and only four returned. There's very little chance she's alive, but Anakin is determined to locate her. While Anakin searches on his own, Obi-Wan lands on Geonosis and dispatches some random lizard that wasn't in the movie. He spots Trade Federation ships landing and unloading a new model of battle droids. These ones are much improved over the originals. Bulkier, more imposing, and they don't talk. At least until the next movie, where they do talk and have the same voices as regular battle droids, because the prequels have this tendency to take anything that's scary and cool and make it stupid somehow. Making his way into a facility, he discovers that this place is being used to mass-produce battle droids. A friggin' army of them. He spots a group heading through the place that includes the Trade Federation Viceroy, who wants to know if Padme is dead yet. He's not joining up with the Separatists until she's dead. So yeah, there's your explanation for the assassination plot. It has nothing to do with her position. It's only because the Viceroy is a petty dickhead. 